Institute for Democracy, um, uh, Citizenship and Public Policy in Africa. Um, many of you uh, would be um, would know by now that uh, the University of Cape Town has uh, suffered the spread of wildfires over the past few days, and uh, we are starting, we are still in a state of shock about what happened. But to um, uh, get the, the mood up and to, to, to remind ourselves of uh, what we do, we thought uh, we should proceed with this event, um, uh, not least because we are very fortunate to host uh, two uh, distinguished scholars in the study, in African studies, particularly in relation to the subject of democracy. Uh, our main speaker today is uh, uh, Nick Chisman, a professor of democracy uh, at the University of Birmingham, uh, and he, um, he will speak for about 30 minutes or, or so, after which he, um, another Nick, um, uh, Nicholas van der Waal, uh, professor of government uh, from uh, Cornell University uh, would share his remarks for about 10 minutes or so before we open the discussion for the Q and A. Uh, because we have uh, a professor of government and a professor of democracy, I uh, will be during this uh, uh, show uh, professor of dictatorship. Um, at this stage, I, I, I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Chisman uh, to um, uh, begin his uh, conversation with us. Perfect, Nick. Thank you so much, Yeshua. Uh, could everybody see that? Everyone yes. can see the PowerPoint? Great. Uh, first of all, um, I think from all the universities that I've been associated with Oxford, Birmingham, we would like to send our, our love and support to UCT at this difficult time. It is a beautiful place. I was very honored to be a visiting professor there and to teach some of your students and to have long engagements with people like Jeremy C. Kings and Bob Matters and to assure you. Um, and I know many of us were devastated to see the flames in the library. So I just wanted to say to everybody, uh, more important than listening to me today, please go and donate so that we can help rebuild the library. I think if the academic community around the world that has benefited from UCT contributes, we can make a tremendous difference over the next few months and help with what Yeshua talked about in terms of lifting spirits. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to be with you today. Um, I said yes very quickly uh, because I never say no to Yeshua and I never say no to UCT. And it was only when I actually hung up from talking to Sushua that I wondered about whether I actually knew anything about democracy in Southern Africa. Many of you will know me more as somebody who writes about Kenya obsessively. And over the last four years, I've actually written a book on Kenya, Uganda and Ghana. So it struck me all of a sudden as being a terrifying ordeal. And I hope you're going to um, appreciate these comments in the spirit with which they're given, which is actually as somebody trying to work out the way that democracy is proceeding in Southern Africa. And you'll see that from the slightly inductive way that I'm going to proceed today. The second thing I'd like to say is that I know that a number of us on the call are part of a broader process where hopefully we're gonna be talking about putting together um, a collaborative research project that will look at this question in considerably more depth. And so one of the things I want to do today is as well as kind of advance my own arguments is to map out the terrain. What are the actual big questions we might want to answer? What are the kind of trends and issues that we might want to bring together if we're going to do that collective research project? What are the sorts of issues that I can't answer today that would be really valuable for us to engage with collectively as we move forwards over the coming months. So as I say, I think this is more a kind of starting the conversation than pre presenting a sort of grand theory that ends the conversation. And in that uh, context and in that spirit, I will start by providing an overview of the performance of Southern African states from around about 1988 to the present day on democracy. I'll then talk a little bit about whether or not what we're really seeing is democratization, autocratization, or perhaps actually stability. And I'll ask a set of questions that push back a little bit on the idea of democratic reversals. I will ask whether we really have seen democratic reversals or whether actually what we're seeing is better characterized as stagnation. Um, and once I've done that, I'll talk a little bit about how we might explain that um, and then what the big questions are that we might still need to be answered. So the state of democracy in Africa today, this is one of the latest graphs from Freedom House that many of you will be aware of. 
Um, it gives you a nice sense of the state of democracy in Southern Africa, as you can see. Uh, we have a set of countries that are traditionally in Freedom House ratings been free, a set that have been partly free, and a small number that have been not free. One of the key things that this map immediately brings to mind is that there's, of course, massive regional variations in the quality of democracy across Africa. West Africa, historically in Freedom House, has been rated as partly free. Uh, East and Central Africa, um, generally speaking, not free or partly free at best. Uh, the same for the Horn, not free. Um, whereas Southern Africa, considerably more democratic on average. And one of the things that I always start with when I give talks about Africa these days to try and get away from the idea that we have one set of democratic trends is to show this graph from Freedom House. Oh, sorry, before I get there, I was just going to tell you what I define as Southern Africa for the purposes of this talk. Um, and being somebody who's done some research recently on Malawi, Zambia and Tanzania, I was slightly sad to see that the VDEM definition of Southern Africa excludes Malawi, which has for some reason hived off to East Africa and excludes Tanzania. But I'm going to include them today uh, to give me a couple of more cases that I've done recent research on that I can include. And I know that in our collaborative research, we may well be including these cases. So the red circle here includes basically all the countries that I'll be talking about today, uh, with the exception of DR Congo, which, which I don't talk about and I wouldn't include within Southern Africa. So it's that set of states. And as I say, when I often start talking about democracy in Africa these days, I start with this graph. Not because I love Freedom House. I think there are many problems with Freedom House and in many ways, the varieties of democracy data set I'll talk about in a minute, gives us a much better and more fine grained analysis of democracy around the world. But Freedom House has done this lovely graph of regional averages within Africa pretty much every year since the early 1990s. And one of the things it's really good for is demonstrating the divergent democratic pathways of the different regions. So if you go back to 1990, what you'll see is that most of the regions are basically reasonably similar, although some are slightly higher than others. And remember, here, higher scores, um, so, so here, higher scores means more democratic. But one of the things you can see very quickly is that around the mid 1990s, we see West Africa and Southern Africa diverge and become considerably more democratic on this measure. Whereas East and Central Africa kind of stagnate and then over the last kind of 10, 15 years decline. So that what we've actually seen is a growing divergence in the quality of democracy by this measure between Southern Africa and West Africa and between East Africa and Central Africa. That's particularly important because, of course, one of the questions somebody might present today is why are we talking about Southern Africa? Is it meaningful to talk about Southern Africa as a region? The fact that Southern Africa has a distinctive democratic pathway here perhaps suggests some reasons why it does make sense to talk about it in regional terms. What they also does, though, I think if we look at this map uh, critically, is it also suggests that there hasn't been an awful lot of change in Southern Africa. If you look at West Africa, as I've said, not only do you see a kind of increase in the quality of democracy according to Freedom House through the 1990s, you see that increasing again in the early 2000s. It's only around 2007 when West Africa hits roughly where Southern Africa is on the Freedom House map, and then basically stays fairly close to South Africa, Southern Africa from there on. Note, Interestingly, in 2017, about the same time that the Nigerian economy was becoming the biggest economy in Africa, West Africa officially overtook Southern Africa for the first time as the most democratic region in Africa. But the bigger points I wanted to bring out here is that if you actually look at the average level of democracy in Southern Africa from 1995 to the present day, what you see is actually very little change on average. Now, it could be that this lack of change at the regional level masks tremendous change within countries. It could be that some countries are going down, other countries going up, and that's simply balancing out at the regional level. But when we look at the regional level, it is striking that for all the talk of democratic reversals, which of course is the title of this, of this event, we actually see almost no fluctuation whatsoever over the last 20 years. In fact, what we really see is remarkable stability. Stability not only in the region, um, but also stability relative to those other regions. Because I've said in all of those other cases, we see considerable change over the last 20 years. So this already starts to suggest a potential research question. The first potential research question would be, do we actually buy 
that we've seen, you know, relative stagnation in the quality of democracy in Southern Africa and not democratic reversals. The second is, do we actually think there's something significantly different about Southern Africa to the other regions that actually explains that stability relative to their uh, different trends? So that would suggest two potential research questions. One, what continental variation, as I say, what explains why Southern Africa seems to have a higher quality of democracy than elsewhere? And two, a regional variation, what explains why some countries within Southern Africa have higher, lower quality of democracy than each other? Now, let's move away from that kind of map of Africa and the trends for different regions to look specifically at Southern Africa. So this is using VDEM data. This is the Liberal Democracy Index. Don't worry if you don't like the Liberal Democracy Index. I'll show you some other indices later that you might prefer. And what you can see here is every country that I've said I'm going to talk a little bit about today from 1980 to the present day. And this is a zero to one scale in which one is most democratic. So what you can see most obviously here is a bump in the 1990s from 1998 to about 1994, which is of course from Namibian independence and um, democratization through to 1994, uh, the end of the apartheid era and the first um, mass electorate uh, election in South Africa. You could see a significant process of increasing uh, levels of democracy through that period. And you perhaps can see towards the very end, a slight trail off in the quality of democracy in the majority of states from say 2018 onwards. So there's two periods here where you can actually see significant changes. But actually, if you look at the 20 years between those two, we actually see something that looks much more like continuity. So here I'm showing you exactly the same graph, but I've shortened the time period from 1996 to the present day. So I've excluded the 1990s democratization, which creates a lot of noise and movement in the previous graph. And what you can see here is in the vast majority of cases, whether we're talking about um, you know, Botswana, South Africa, Zambia, we actually see relatively consistent evaluations of the quality of democracy across these 20 years. There's one case here, um, oop, maybe I didn't include this one. Um, and what that gives us, if you look at the average overall, and this is quite remarkable, right, is that the VDEM average quality of democracy for Southern Africa as a region from 1996 to the 2020 is basically a flat line. There is no variation here. There is no suggestion of democratic reversal perhaps at the very end. But if we look again, even from 2018 to 2020 here, we don't see a significant dip between the level of democracy on average in 1996. Um, if we want to look at a different index, like I said, you might think that the liberal democracy index isn't very useful. Maybe that's measuring some kind of Western democracy. It's putting in a lot of civil liberties. Maybe that's not a useful measure in this context. Maybe we need something else. But if we move away from that measure to look at the uh, electoral democracy index, which is a more kind of uh, narrow index focusing on elections and processes around elections and stripping out some of that broader kind of liberal democracy uh, components, we see a very similar picture, very consistent levels of democracy in different countries, some movements, Angola improving in the quality of democracy over time. Um, but the only real case here that I would say suggests significant democratic reversal um, and significant chopping and changing is actually the case of Madagascar, which in the period of coup and counter coup of uh, uh, Ravala Manana and Andrew Ajalina and the chaos within Antananarivo elites has this kind of period of democratic backsliding and then reversal once civilian rule is put back in place. But with the exception of Madagascar, the vast majority of the other countries here actually see significant levels of continuity. Now, when I first saw this, it kind of made me second guess VDEM more than believe that there was consistent democratization, because of course I've been part of conversations in which we've delighted at Zambia's democratic breakthrough in 2011 when Michael Sato won power and despaired. Um, at the process of democratic backsliding under Edgar Lungu, where we've worried about the process of Malawian democracy under Bingu, uh, but then celebrated in 2019 and 20 as the courts came through and all of a sudden we saw not only the, uh, uh, but the overturning of a presidential election result for the second time in African history after Kenya in 2017, but also then 
um, an opposition able to win the rerun election, which of course wasn't the case in Kenya. And of course, I've also been in Zimbabwe, you know, through the highs and lows, um, you know, the, the death of Robert Mugabe and the hope of a new uh, democratic dispensation under Emerson Mnangagwa, and then the kind of problems around the 2018 elections, the killing of uh, protesters afterwards, and so on. And from all of those experiences, it feels like there's been a tremendous amount of volatility in the quality of democracy in those countries. But I suppose when I took a step back, it made me wonder, were all of those moments more about us as researchers, as citizens, as activists, projecting our hopes and dreams onto political systems that actually didn't change very much? Is it actually possible that the VDEM coders, and this is all of this data is coded by experts who are brought together by VDEM from the countries concerned and international experts who are asked to provide these evaluations and also a confidence interval for how confidence, confident they are about the evaluations. Is it possible that they've actually right? that actually what we were doing is projecting aspirations, hopes, dreams onto particular individuals assessing high levels of regime change between, say, you know, Banda, Wanawasa, Lungu, Chaluba uh, in one context, or Nkapa, Kikweti, uh, Magafuli in another, when actually the political systems themselves changed relatively little during this period, and actually the quality of democracy perhaps was more consistent than we've given it credit for. And to some extent, I'm more minded towards this right now because I made a very similar argument to this in a recent article in the Journal of Democracy, which basically asks that, uh, argues that much of the kind of expectation of democratization of uh, expectation of democratization in Tanzania, for example, um, prior to Kikwete coming to power, um, and then sort of belief that Tanzanian democracy had fallen off the cliff under Magafuli, basically overlooked the fundamental reality that CCM was consistently an authoritarian regime that simply deployed force when it needed to. And that it didn't deploy force for a while was not a sign that it had become a democracy, but simply a sign that it wasn't necessary. When the opposition gained in support, the force came back. So I'm slightly more minded than I would have been before writing that paper to buy the argument that actually what we've seen in most southern African states is remarkable consistency in the level of democracy and a relatively high level of consistency in the level of democracy in southern Africa itself. But I'll be very interested to hear what your thoughts about whether or not this kind of matches your own personal expectations and beliefs. I sort of thought about doing a poll before this talk, asking people whether they thought the level of democracy had been consistent over time and then comparing it with this data and then asking you the same question afterwards to see whether the presentation of some of this data changed any of your opinions. And as I say, on the Electoral Democracy Index, much like on the Liberal Democracy Index, it's pretty much a flat line. There's no significant evidence here of democratization. There's no significant evidence of movement away from democracy. The other thing that's perhaps worth saying here uh, is that there's relatively few countries in Southern Africa on this measure that have achieved anything close to full democracy. If we think about that as being the kind of 0 0.8 to 1 bracket at the very top of this. Um, most Southern African states for the entirety of this period have been bracketed in what we would roughly call the competitive authoritarian or electoral authoritarian position. Uh, we see competitive multi-party elections, but we also see unfair advantages for the ruling party. The obvious exceptions to that, um, the countries higher up here are Botswana, Namibia, and Southern Africa. But with the exception of those three states, um, we're really talking about a group of states that are sort of classic competitive authoritarian states in the Levitskian way terminology, uh, with higher and level, um, lower, <clears throat> Let respect the political rights and civil liberties between them, that, but there's very few high quality democracies here, even in the, of course, the region in Africa, which I've already said is the highest in terms of the quality of democracy or on a par now with Western Africa. So, what does all of that suggest? Um, before I draw some broad conclusions, I think it's also worth noting that public opinion in some Southern African states hasn't moved as much as it has in the rest of the continent. Some of you will have been paying attention to recent releases by the Afrobarometer, which suggests that there's declining kind of patience with uh, the poor performance of democracy in many countries. Uh, Robert Madders, Michael Braddon and others have pointed out that that seems to be related to declining um, confidence in elections. 
African populations appear to be growing increasingly frustrated that elections have not delivered either political or economic change and lower or falling uh, recognition or falling approval or belief that elections can change uh, the party in power seems to be correlated with growing dissatisfaction with the performance of democracy, at least in a significant number of countries and to an extent overall. When we look at things in Southern Africa, though, it looks a little bit differently. So on the left, you see the first Afrobarometer round that asked how satisfied people were with democracy in 2002 to three. And on the right, you see the same question, but in 2016 to 18. What you can actually see, so on, on the very far left, you've got this country is not a democracy. So people who essentially rejected the question and said it's not a democracy. The blue is then um, very dissatisfied. Um, and then you go all the way through to the kind of green color, which is very satisfied. And one of the things that have struck me looking at this is there's not a tremendous amount here of variation between the two sides. Um, if you look, for example, at the proportion of uh, Botswanans, uh, Malawians, Namibians, we tend to see the very satisfied going down a bit, but quite a lot of that is going into the fairly satisfied. The dissatisfied and not at all satisfied hasn't expanded that much in most of these countries. It has in some. The obvious country where we've seen significant increase in dissatisfaction is, of course, South Africa, which has gone from, I think, that 16 percent to 31 percent. So South Africa is perhaps the country here where public opinion on democracy has shifted the greatest. In Malawi, we also see a significant increase in the proportion of people dissatisfied. But I would believe that that number will be different following the transfer of power. 2020. And I think in the next Afrobarometer, we'll see what Michael Braddon has talked about as the alternation effect, in which an alternation of power leads to greater confidence in democracy and renewed faith in the power of elections. So we see some increasing dissatisfaction here. Um, but not necessarily tremendous shifts and not necessarily the kind of shifts in dissatisfaction with democracy in some of these countries that you would expect expect, given some of the narrative that people like myself have contributed to in terms of perceptions of the failure of democracy or the struggles of democracy over the last 20 years. So where does this all leave us as an initial kind of pitch of what the broader data tells us before we start talking more about cases? Perhaps three key take homes at this level uh, that I'd like to sort of pitch to you all. The first is that, you know, um, there's less variation than uh, media and academic debates might suggest, uh, both in the country level and regionally in terms of Southern African uh, democracy as a whole. And we can discuss whether or not that regional average is useful and means anything. But as I say, we also see that consistency at national level. Um, national variation is limited. Most countries are roughly where they were in 1996, which I think again is interesting. On the one hand, that suggests we haven't seen significant democratic reversals, but of course it also suggests we've seen almost no genuine democratic consolidation. We've actually got countries in pretty similar situations to 1996. Um, the other thing that I think it brings out is that despite the continent's reputation for instability and the frequent media depictions of that, in many countries, substantial change actually occurs fairly gradually. We do not see rapid political change in increasing levels of democracy or increasing levels of autocratization uh, on tremendous levels. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about that is that we've often perceived, as I've said, that there is tremendous change between different leaders, between a Magafuli, a Kikweti, a Mkapa, between a Jacob Zuma and Nelson Mandela and a Tabo and Becky. Uh, but the data that we're being presented with here actually suggests that those differences are relatively slight when it comes to the overall quality of democracy itself. Does that reflect what we see in the rest of the continent? When I was doing a little bit of research for this last night, and I must apologize to the other Nick for only sending him the PowerPoint for this this morning, so he hasn't had very long to, to look over the ideas. It was a bit of a rush at the last minute. When I was looking at this last night, I came across the report that I wrote uh, for the Bertelsmann Transformation Index in 2020, which reviews the progress of democracy in Africa in that year. And one of the things I wrote in that report actually struck me as really having very strong echoes of exactly what I've just said about Southern Africa. So the executive summary of that report begins. 
Contrary to media depictions of sub-Saharan Africa, in many countries, political change has tended to occur gradually. From 2015 to 2019, the general pattern has been for the continent's more authoritarian states, such as Djibouti, Equatorial Guinea, Eritrea, and Rwanda, to make little little progress towards democracy and in some cases to become incrementally more repressive. At the same time, many of the country's more democratic states, including Botswana, Ghana, Mauritius, Senegal and South Africa, have remained consolidating or defective democracies, with very few of these dropping out of that category to become authoritarian regimes. Overall, only 16 countries saw their ranking in any one of the categories, i.e. the categories evaluated by the BTI, which are democracy, governance and economic management. Um, only 16 countries saw their ranking uh, between the last two rounds change, uh, which is just 12% of all cases. The main exceptions to this rule are countries that suffered a rapid escalation of conflict, such as South Sudan in 2013, or the sudden collapse of governments, such as Burkina Faso in 2015. So there's a potential line of argument here that actually what we see in Southern Africa, although it's particularly pronounced in Southern Africa in terms of the stability of democracy within countries and stability of democracy within the region, is actually something that we see on a much broader level across Africa and often goes misunderstood, that there's actually an awful lot more continuity than media depictions would give credit to. So... What does this then suggest in terms of research questions and the ways forward for our broader research agenda about pathways towards and away from democracy? I mean, there's an alternative interpretation here, which is that VDEM and Freedom House simply aren't capturing reality. It could be that there's something else going on beneath these headline figures that we think is actually substantial and has changed and that we would actually like to challenge the kind of idea that there hasn't really been significant democratic progress or erosion of democracy. It might be that what's happening is that some of the key institutions are being hollowed out without that necessarily being fully represented in these indicators. And of course, indicators of democracy do have a reputation for shifting just after the event rather than just before the event being reactive more than being prescient. So it could be that that's the case. If that's not the case, then it suggests something else. It suggests that we do need to explain something here, but what we need to explain is not actually pathways towards democratization and autocratization, but the absence of those pathways, actually a high level of stability, not a high stability of high democratic quality, but this kind of middle ground that I've described. That would suggest, as I've said, that actually the key impact here is not leaders, but systems, that the differences between rival leaders and indeed between different political parties has been relatively minor. And it's the political systems in which leaders and parties are embedded that have been much more important. That in turn, I think, raises a critical question of kind of theoretical methodology and how we want to approach and model and understand that. It seems to me that there are two broad plausible explanations for kind of trying to explain that level of stability. One is to argue that the underlying conditions that were present in 1996, in other words, the basic conditions under which multi-party politics emerged have remained. And it's the consistency of those underlying factors that has ensured relative consistency in the performance of democracy in Southern Africa. So, I, in other words, that key initial starting conditions have effectively remained in place, and it's the persistence of those conditions that has led to stability. The alternative argument is to say that actually those conditions have changed quite radically at the moment of transition. At the moment of movement to multi-partyism, certain processes locks them in to the political system, lock them into the constitution, lock them into the balance of power, lock them into the institutional configuration of the country in a way that had a path dependent effect. In other words, even though those underlying conditions changed over the next 20 years, because they molded political systems in a very specific way, those systems kind of froze or locked in that balance of power, and that balance of power is therefore continued over the last 20 years. And it's that that explains the relative stability that we appear to see. So what about these two different explanations? What would they actually look like if we looked at them in practice? 
And as I say here, I think this then leads us to, to potentially two revised research questions from the two that I kind of highlighted initially. One about which factors actually explain why Southern Africa as a region has achieved initially, but then maintains the much higher quality of democracy. And again, why certain countries within Southern Africa initially achieved and then maintained the high quality of democracy, moving the focus onto stability away from uh, significant variation. So how do we explain continuity? As I say, we could do this by arguing that, you know, actually what happened was there was a consistent context. We see roughly the same conditions today as we did in the 1990s. So it shouldn't be surprising that we see high levels of consistency over time. And if we did that, we might want to look at three different kinds of you know, outcomes or contexts. We might look at socioeconomic factors, international factors, and popular support for democracy. If we were to look at you know, socioeconomic factors, I think you know, we'd want to be paying attention to things like wealth, which of course Dvorsky and colleagues have told us has a significant correlation to the stability of democratic political systems. The strength of trade unions and civil society groups that figures like Equete and Adler and Webster in the South African context have talked about as providing a key bulwark against authoritarianism. And of course, the risk of the politicization of ethnicity uh, undermining democratic consolidation by creating contestation about who does and does not get to exert political rights. The challenge, I think, in terms of these three factors is that it's not clear to me that we can argue that there's been consistency here. Uh, on the one hand, we have countries like Zambia that have gone through major periods of boom and bust due to variations in copper prices. We have significant economic changes in countries like Zimbabwe, which have gone through terrible economic times. We also see in a number of countries processes of informalization of labor and privatization cripple the power of trade unions and undermine the capacity of civil society groups to hold government to account. So it's not clear to me that this set of socioeconomic factors has stayed consistent enough over time to be a good explanation for why we see relatively low levels of democratic volatility in Southern Africa, although some of them clearly do play a role. Another hypothesis would, of course, be that it's international factors. Uh, the idea that democracy in Africa was internationally supplied is still something that, despite being mistaken, is repeated regularly, especially on my Twitter feed. And of course, we have the famous argument of Levitsky and Way that the linkage and leverage of international actors, in other words, the extent to which uh, countries are embedded within economic networks that allows Western pro-democratic powers to exert economic influence over them, um, plays a significant role in the degree of um, democratization. And the level of multi Western support for multi-partyism, of course, is all often argued, again, to be a significant force. But here again, I'm not entirely sure that this makes a kind of comprehensive argument or a very persuasive argument in terms of understanding the lack of democratic volatility in Southern Africa for a couple of reasons. I mean, one, we've seen the move from relative US hegemony in the early 1990s and the end of history to a multipolar world in which China plays a very dominant position in a number of African countries. Shishua has recently been tweeting about the Chinese ambassador turning up to the Patriotic Front Convention in Zambia and talking about wishing good electoral success for the ruling party. That was not something that was happening in the early 90s. 1990s. And the commitment and determination of Western powers to promote democracy in Africa does not appear to me to be as significant today as it was at the height of the drive for multipartyism in the mid 1990s, even though it was, of course, compromised even then. We could think of French complicity in the Rwandan genocide, the UK supporting Museveni not having multi party elections in Uganda, and so on. So, again, it's not entirely clear to me that this set of conditions has actually proved to be consistent over the last 20 years and can explain the stability of democracy in Southern Africa. What about popular support for democracy? Now, on the one hand, we know that there's mass support for democratic government in most African countries, not all. Um, and we know from the work of people like Lisa Mueller and Branchi Manpili um, that popular protests have been a very important force for democratization. I think here, perhaps in some ways, there is something that strikes me as being something that's more consistent. If we look at that Afrobarometer data, as I've said, there's growing dissatisfaction with democracy in a number of countries, but there's not, as of yet, a willingness to turn people's back on democracy, although the willingness to trade off elections for effective governments has increased in 
number of countries, we still see vast majorities of people supporting multi-party politics. So popular support for democracy is perhaps something that's been relatively consistent, although people might argue that even this has been waning in the last four or five years. And again, perhaps this is not something that can fully explain the stability of democracy across the region. So what does that then bring me to? And I'm drawing towards a kind of close here. Well, then, if we wanted to explain this by path dependency, what are the key kind of path dependent arguments that we've seen over the last few years be made by leading scholars? Where the institutional side is the case, of course, we've seen Braddon and Van der Waal have to get in some good citations to Nick here, so he's kind to me later, um, you know, made very influential arguments in the early 1990s about the significance of the former regime type, suggesting, for example, that you might be better off democratizing out of a one party state that was more participatory than a more venal in one party dictatorship than military regimes in terms of having, uh, on the one hand, instituted norms and values of pluralism and electoral competition, and on the other of kind, of course, actually instituting institutions that support that. There's also a kind of second version of that, of course, in the Southern African context, which is rather South, Roger Southall's argument about the long-term institutional legacies of liberation party movements and the way in which the hierarchy and need for secrecy of liberation parties when in exile or fighting rebel wars encouraged that to be then taken on when they took power and that contributing in some cases to a reluctance to tolerate dissent and a willingness to use violence and that being an institutional legacy that comes very specifically from some of those historical contexts in southern africa we also have a really good argument um, of people like Brad, uh, Posner and Young, who argue that actually we see significant precedent setting in the early 1990s. In almost every case where a president respects presidential term limits for the first time, the subsequent president respects presidential term limits. In the vast majority of cases in which the first president does not respect presidential term limits, the subsequent president does not respect presidential term limits. Now that of course is related to a number of factors such as the presidents of oil, the significance of international actors, the strength of civil society, but Posner and Young suggest that there's also a kind of institutional norm creating effect, that it becomes more costly and more difficult for subsequent leaders to actually rebel against the norm once it's been established. Very briefly, in terms of the process and the mode of transition, we see people like Rachel Riedel arguing and explaining that the initial balance of power and negotiations shaped the constitutional change that happened. Where the ruling party was in charge, we saw relatively little constitutional change. Where the opposition was very powerful, we saw bigger negotiations and a greater degree of constitutional change. And that then sets a different political landscape where we see a much more competitive political landscape. We see much more constitutional change, which then locks in the ability to have competitive politics thereafter. And again, this idea that certain moments in the 1990s locked in a certain type of politics that then exerts this institutional constraint thereafter. And similarly, the Adler and Webster on pactive negotiated transitions. So in this context, for example, we would expect to see higher levels of sustained democracy in countries like South Africa, Namibia, uh, to a certain extent, countries like Zambia, where we saw strong civil society support for transitions, and therefore the balance of power was on the side of those who wanted reform, forcing more progressive constitutions and therefore creating an opportunity for shifting the goalposts and building in higher levels of democracy that could then be sustained throughout the 1990s. And finally, to wrap up, there's also potentially, of course, an argument here about regional effects, locking, you know, combining that argument that we've just been talking about, about locking in certain democratic gains in the early 1990s. We could export that argument to explain why Southern Africa is perhaps more democratic than other regions, because we could argue that Southern Africa and Western Africa established more democratic regional bodies in the early 1990s that had a greater focus on democracy and human rights. Not a high focus, but a greater focus than, for example, the East African community or the African Union writ large. And it was the willingness of those bodies to start policing their neighbors and the fact that other countries were more democratic that then sustained high levels of democracy over the next few years. So just to wrap up, what do I think that all leaves us with. I've thrown an awful lot of different theoretical ideas and frameworks at you to try and explain this continuity. Where do I think it comes out? 
I think there is some evidence that some of the context that we saw in the early 1990s has stayed. You know, it's still true that it's valuable to countries to be seen as democratic regimes, even if that's only a token recognition. And there's still clear public support for democracy. So it's costly to governments to move away from democracy, at least officially. But I don't think that that's enough. I think we've actually seen significant variation in international support and significant variation in economic conditions. So I do think it's then valuable to move to those path dependent arguments and to start thinking about in the ways in which the changes and processes of the early 1990s locked in different possibilities of democracy in different countries, creating greater opportunities in some and constraining the potential for change in others. Within that, I think regional factors are not completely insignificant, but I think in almost all cases in sub-Saharan Africa, we know that international drivers of democratization are less significant than domestic drivers of democratization. So I wouldn't weight those too highly, though I think it's worth having a look at them. I think there's a really big question then in terms of the future. I know some of you will feel that democracy in Africa is moving backwards and you'll worry about what the next two or three years will bring. And I think that's a perfectly valid concern. As I showed you, the last couple of years of most of the democracy ratings indices show a decline in democracy in a number of countries. I think the key question then is, are we going to see new sets of conditions emerge that will actually erode the gains that were locked in in the early 1990s? In other words, if part of what we're seeing is consistent conditions combined with a degree of path dependency, when does that path dependency erode? When does it start to fade away? Is it locked in for good or does it have a kind of shelf life? If it does, that would be the point at which to start being really concerned about the quality of democracy in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about public attitudes towards democracy, but I'll skip that because I've talked a bit about it. And I'm running out of time. So just to end, I wanted to end by, first of all, inviting you to, you know, shoot um, pot shots at my different comments here. Yeah, I think I've start, tried to start a conversation, as I say, rather than end one. But I've got kind of five things that I think it would be really exciting for people to work on, including myself. But hopefully some of you might be interested in some of these ideas. I think it would be great for us to go beyond the democracy indexes and ask whether we think VDEM and Freedom House headline figures are masking more important changes. Are there actually processes of democratic hollowing out or consolidation that are being missed? I think that would be a really fascinating study. I think it would be good to systematically evaluate the context when we actually start to do proper quantitative and qualitative analysis. Exactly how has the economic backdrop and the quality of linkage and leverage changed? And to what extent can we say that stability is related to consistent context. I think it would be great to trace institutions. To what extent did the institutional landscape created in the 1990s embed and constrain certain forms of democratic practice in ways that continues to shape political processes today? I think it would be great for us to start assessing the formation of norms and values values. How are supporting informal institutions for things like presidential term limits built? Can we actually track and measure them in progress as we speak in countries like Kenya, where we might not have expected democratic term limits to actually take effect, but they appear to have done so at least so far. And in terms of those regional effects, I think it would be interesting to have projects that would actually probe the impact of regional bodies on democracy, but also the positive and negative externalities that come from being in a neighbourhood that's more democratic or less democratic, which may be as high for democracy as they are for economic growth itself. And with that, I will rest and look forward to the comments of the other Nick. Thank you so much, Nick. You have given us so much and uh, to help us unpack all that and um, to clarify a couple of points or dismiss everything you have said. Nick, or up to you now. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me and for organizing this session in, in, in what must be a pretty traumatic uh, a period um, for, the, for the university. I, I appreciate it, and and uh, um, I, uh, I I've seen online different uh, suggestions of of ways to to helping uh, uh, the university, and I hope the, that that um, that you know the American community uh, of Africans can can contribute to that um, very much. Uh, so um, let's see. I have uh, I've. 15 minutes. Um, I, um, I agree with a, basically a lot of, of what the other Nick has, has, has said. Um, 
And uh, I want to do the following. I mean, Nick, uh, Nick has been, you know, as, as we've come to expect from him, uh, very, very comprehensive and, 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 and insightful uh, delivering one key insight. I, I counted basically every 30 seconds. Um, so I, 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 what I want to do is I want to just do what I view as the four key takeaways from, from, uh, from the talk. And then I want to um, add three comments, um, uh, both that, that are, uh, I, I think maybe I, I would have emphasized more in the talk and, and more sort of looking forward. And I'll end with a kind of a, a positive scenario uh, for the region and 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 um, and two related negative scenarios. Um, okay, so so um, in terms of of just I think key takeaways, which I, I broadly agree with. The first one is you know the Democ the the backsliding narrative doesn't fit the Africa region particularly well. Uh, um, I I worry about subregional trends because. Once you start talking about less than ten countries, you know individual country trajectories can affect the subregional trend, uh, and and that's been my problem with Freedom House's sort of key takeaway that you know democracy is advancing in West Africa but retreating in East Africa. One or two countries are 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 directing those um, uh, allegedly divergent trends, and I'm I'm. I'm kind of skeptical, but in general, uh, you know, Nick is exactly right. Africa seems to be in a electoral autocratic equilibrium and has been roughly since um, the, the large gains of the early nineties. There's some exceptions to that, um, you know, and every year there's, uh, there's some good stories and some bad stories, um, but on the whole, it's, it's, a, it's remarkable uh, given, um, you know what our expectations were in in 1996. Secondly, um, uh, the democracy indices are powerful data. Life is much better since uh, VDEM has come into existence for scholars. You know, uh, anecdotes are a debased currency when you have uh, um, uh, broad uh, uh, quantitative data. But having said that, they're flawed, and I. And I, I think uh, one really ambitious project I have for you is, is to start measuring democracy other than through experts. You know, uh, expert uh, data is, is flawed. There are herd effects there, you know, um, um, I don't, for some reason, scholars have a, a love of, of regional and global trends. They, they desperately want Africa to participate in every global trend. And, um, and, and I think some of the indices reflect that. Um, third, uh, public support for democracy seems resilient, but it, it, does, it is thin. Now, I, I'm not entirely sure what the average Zambian thinks uh, she is answering when she's asked you know, what she thinks about Zambian democracy, since Zambia is not really a democracy. Um, and uh, if she's unhappy with the state of Zambian democracy, is that a statement of saying that she doesn't think it's really democratic or that she thinks it's democratic but not working very well? And I, it's, that's a, one of the questions in Freedom House that I've never um, you know, re really liked. Fourth, uh, Nick is exactly right to emphasize uh, institutional legacies um, uh, how, and how they constrain uh, you know, the current politics um, both in, in negative and positive ways. I think the democratization literature underestimated the role of formal institutions in shaping African politics. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, there, there's a ton of evidence that they continue to shape uh, the, the path, uh, uh, the political path in countries, even when you have um, political alternation. Okay. So I, I, I mean, I, I generally agree. I could have added uh, a couple more takeaways that I that I agree with, but th but those strike me as um, the key uh, the, the key takeaways. So let me let me um, make sort of three points that are not in necessarily in disagreement with with uh, 
uh, with the presentation, but um, which I, I, I want to put a distinct uh, maybe spin on. Uh, the first is about the international dimension. I very much agree that um, the, the, the West's attitudes about democracy in the region have, have changed uh, in part because of the emergence of China, in part, although this has less of an effect, I think in Southern Africa, because of the rise of, of uh, Islamic uh, um, radicalism in, in the region. And that, that enormously shapes um, uh, you know, Western policies to the region. I, I see that um, President Debbie of, of Chad died uh, yesterday. Um, he was um, basically given a free pass for the last 10 years uh, um, to do whatever he wanted to do in Chad because of his support and active support uh, for the fight um, against uh, radical uh, Islam by the French and, and the Americans uh, in, in the Sahel. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I think what, what the region has suggested is the limits of the Levitsky way uh, leverage linkage model. Uh, what's striking to me is, is how limited the leverage always was uh, and how even more limited it's become now because of the decline of foreign aid um, relative to, to African uh, economies. Um, but what's striking is the extent to which uh, incumbent regimes in the region have, have come to realize that there's little of, a little cost to opposing um, the, the West, even when uh, it's, it's, it's tied both through economic linkages and through an aid dependency on, on the West. And, and I'm talking about, about Kenya during the ICC episode. I'm talking about um, the pushback by African governments on LGBT uh, issues the willingness of African incumbents in a number of countries to, to punish actively uh, civil society associations in their country that are, that are supported by the West and so on. It turns out that, that, that the West is often unpopular with publics in, in the Africa region and that there's just not much of a cost um, to, uh, to sort of thumbing it, uh, its nose at, uh, at the West. Um, uh, indeed, in, in some cases, notably, I think, on the LGBT community um, stuff, there's actually a political advantage uh, to doing so. Okay? Uh, so that's my, my, my first. Now, now to end, uh, to, to finish uh, last, I guess I have about five minutes to go. Um, let, me, let me spin out a, a positive scenario and a negative scenario. So on the positive front, um, I think... I think uh, this is a little, little long-winded, but but bear with me. First, I want to say that you know um, the early '90s saw real progress, not so much on democratization as on opening up political participation. Uh, what what the the what the third wave democratization episodes did was was institutionalize regular multi-party elections and much greater political freedom, you know, uh, with the media and, and, and so on. It, it's now, I think it should be clear now that all of the progress it made were, was on what democratic theorists have called mechanisms of vertical accountability. Okay, that's what we're talking about when we talk about participation. It made much less progress on horizontal accountability. And that is basically mechanisms by which um, the other branches of government and, and key players in civil society and in, say in the business community constrain the executive. And the, the, the definition of an electoral autocracy, it seems to me, is a, country, is, is a regime that has relatively decent mechanisms of vertical accountability. I mean, elections are not perfectly free and fair, but they're genuine participatory exercises and virtually no mechanisms of, of horizontal accountability. That is to say that it's, the, it, it, it's very, very hard to constrain uh, the executive uh, in most African countries, the exception being the, about the third of African countries that have 
uh, uh, term limits. And, and term limits is, 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 is maybe the best single example we have of a mechanism of horizontal accountability. Um, future progress of in the in the region, not consolidation. I, I think democratic consolidation is a is a term that has uh, you know outlived its usefulness. But um, future progress will come through uh, improvements in mechanisms of horizontal accountability. And what we know from from the rest of the world is that horizontal accountability relies on elite pacting. Elite pacts uh, of the kind that happened in Southern Europe, uh, in countries like Poland right after uh, the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall, uh, and in parts of, 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 of Latin America, where elites broadly come to an understanding about the kind of democracy they want and what the executive will be able to do and not to do. These are not broadly progress on horizontal accountability have been elite driven rather than uh, mass public driven. Uh, and um, the positive scenario is one that we, I, I thought we had seen in a country like Senegal, but which I would argue occurred to a limited extent in countries like Kenya, Nigeria, and Senegal, which did not undergo um, protest-driven democratization in the early 90s. But subsequently, Ghana would be another example. There was a broad elite agreement in those countries uh, uh, to move towards greater democratization. The positive scenario for the region is, is one where elites come to agree for a variety of reasons that we can investigate uh, on um, you know, constraining the executive uh, more thoroughly than is the case today. And, and when we have elites that are united and willing to do this, I think we will see progress. I think that's the, the sort of positive agenda in, in the region. Now on the kind of negative side, I, I started to write an article a couple of years ago called, which was, I, I had the title, but not much else, was why are there no populists uh, in Africa? And, and at that point I thought, okay, the only uh, you know, head of state in Africa that could legitimately be called a populist in the way it was being defined in the literature was probably Sata in, 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 in Zambia. Um, and then as I was writing, people said, well, that's not totally true. What about um, Bagbo in Ivory Coast? Uh, he was kind of a populist. And what about Magafuli who then, you know, uh, um, while I was dithering, uh, was was emerging. Uh, I still think that it's surprising, given the the increasingly large you know population of urban poor, that we don't have uh, pop more populism in the Africa region. Um, and if you think of um, if, as Nick suggested, you think of growing. Uh, contentiousness, growing protest, uh, you know, growing sort of popular participation as, as a trend which will continue to increase, then it's, it's sooner or later, more African leaders will, will you know, um, see all the votes that are, are, uh, are um, waiting for them in, in, um, uh, in urban slums and, and uh, with, uh, you know, uh, lower working class types of, of voters who are looking for a handout uh, from the government, looking for more social spending, um, but willing to come on board uh, with various cultural and ethnic inducements as, as well. And, and I do think that is one of the scenarios that is lurking, uh, you know, negatively uh, for for the region. Now, the the, the second negative scenario uh, is is um, is why are there we we could ask why are there no African Pinochet? Why are there no you know um, leaders who emerge as kind of law and order people who uh, um, uh, get their votes from the the rising middle class uh, and uh, maybe economic elites that start to worry about their property rights, that start to worry that um, uh, 
you know, um, there's too much protest. There's too much uh, contentiousness. And I, I, I'm not sure. I had, I had thought that Buhari in Nigeria might morph into a, 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 um, that kind of leader, but um, he, he has not. But I think that's another scenario where, um, uh, where and we see the, the, the mass public sort of break down, um, you know, uh, um, in favor of, of, uh, of a kind of law and order um, authoritarian um, revival. And, and, and that I think could happen in, in a number of countries. But, but uh, and, and so I think I, I would encourage us to think about these different scenarios um, uh, that would shake up the kind of stability and continuity uh, that, that Nick has uh, documented today. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, we have run out of time, but I was wondering if uh, both of you are available for a couple of uh, additional minutes to take questions from the audience. Yeah. Um, um, thank you. Before I, I get the questions, um, I wanted to give Nick a chance to perhaps put a few comments uh, on what uh, Nick has said. <laughs> no, I, I agree with, with all of the things Nick has said, which is terrible. I should disagree profoundly. I'm rather devastated that I talked for 40 minutes and then he summarized it up in one beautiful sentence, which is Africa is at a competitive authoritarian equilibrium. I could have just said that and gone home, right? Um, you should never be followed by someone more eloquent than yourself. But, um, but I fully agree uh, with what he said. I think the one thing I would say, you know, for my recent research, for example, in Malawi, is that I do think sometimes, you know, these things go together. So Nick divided up very nicely the kind of horizontal and vertical accountability, arguing that we've seen, you know, increased vertical accountability little horizontal, and I think that's true. I do think there are a few cases where we have seen that slightly growing horizontal inequality, uh, accountability. You know, Joel Barkin and Ken Apollo have shown us that the Kenyan legislature occasionally has uh, more teeth than uh, we might have expected. And in Malawi recently, of course, we've seen, you know, I've sort of modeled along with um, Golden Matonga and also uh, Boniface Jelani, the kind of Malawian transition and democratic moment in 2019-20 as, as basically a set of horizontal institutions coming of age. You know, the military, which played an important role in 94 in putting down vigilante groups, an important role in the transition to Joyce Banda's presidency and making sure the constitution was followed, stood up to be counted. The legislature actually passed legislation to demand a fresh election. The judiciary said that the election wasn't good quality and demanded a new one. The electoral commission, when it pushed came to shove, delivered a good quality election. All of these sort of horizontal institutions came of age at a, at a moment. Um, and, you know, following the kind of process that Nick was saying, but that wasn't divorced from mass po politics. In fact, you know, there's a good argument that it was the mass protests of HRDC human rights defenders coalitions in the streets on a regular basis that put the pressure on those institutions to start to perform their democratic role in a more forthright and activist fashion. So I think there's an interesting line there that actually, yes, there is that kind of elite pacting, there is that gradual development, but it's that mass protest element that actually sometimes can push those institutions into performing in a different way by demonstrating to them the high costs of actually not doing so. And therefore we might need a kind of model that combines that horizontal and vertical accountability in terms of being able to understand which countries we see that in. But I also agree with him that, you know, that's a process in Malawi that has been going on from the 1994 to the present day with successive iterations of gradual, um, you know, institutional strengthening that's not something we could pull off tomorrow, say, in Zambia, where the simple, similar processes simply haven't taken place over the last decade. And so whilst it's really valuable to learn from those kinds of examples, it also highlights the difficulties of building this kind of gradual incremental democratic progress. But let's take some questions from the audience. They've been waiting a while. Thanks, Nick, for the insight. Um, so we'll take questions. Just raise your hand on the screen. Uh, uh, in the meantime, we have a couple of questions uh, on the chat section. One is one says, um, um, "Thanks a lot, Nick, for the presentation. I have a couple of issues for consideration. Firstly, methodologically, it would be good to clarify regionness in Southern Africa. I used, I'm using the concept region 
either political construct or geographical construct. And, and secondly, this leads to the clarification of the criteria for inclusion and exclusion of countries in your model. For instance, why are countries like Eswatini and Lesotho left out of the list of countries chosen? Why do you include Madagascar and Tanzania, which are in Eastern Africa while living out Mauritius and seashells? Um, and then you have another one from Jeremy who is asking, so I have a comment and a question for Nick, uh, for Nick, uh, so both of you. Uh, I like uh, Nick Cheeseman's suggestion that we pro problematize the expert data that we are using as our dependent variable. Uh, I suspect much of this comes from the Afrobarometer data. Um, I suggest that re retrospective assessments sometimes differ from contemporary assessments. Question, if you're explaining continuity or more precisely enduring variation, why not engage with the political settlement literature? Um, any so other questions? We can maybe, take those maybe I should uh, take those two quickly and, and work backwards. I think Jeremy's absolutely right. You know, if you're doing, a, if you're coding for VDEM and your VDEM is created in whenever it was, 2016, 17. So you're coding for VDEM in 2015, 16. You're coding all of those years backwards in one go. So it's very tempting to read a kind of either pathway towards democracy or level of continuity into that history if you've had a significant period of democratic progress and then recession. Because of course, with the benefit of hindsight, that looks like something that was more ephemeral than perhaps it looked like at the time. So I think the fact that VDEM was coded in one go backwards rather than you know, simultaneously being coded year on year is a significant factor. And I think Jeremy's right about that. And one of the things I've been encouraging my PhD students to do, and I think it would be a fabulous project, is to do um, exactly what the other Nick was saying and actually really interrogate qualitatively what we get if we put up a qualitative analysis next to the quantitative analysis. One of the things I've been doing that gets at that a little bit is some research on what William Reno called the shadow state, or South Africans have talked about more as state capture, which is looking at the hollowing out of democratic institutions in ways that are often not very high profile or explicit, but for example, allow criminal networks, non-political networks, unelected individuals to interfere with and engage with political processes. And in countries like Zimbabwe, Zambia, etc., you know, that process has been running through the last 10, 15 years, but it's not something I think that is visible or easy enough to pick up for democracy ratings indexes to be able to capture it. So there's something there potentially about the hollowing out of democratic institutions that's being missed. And of course, it's also true that we regularly miss major political transfers like Burkina Faso, for example, like Gambia, that are very rarely predicted by democracy ratings indices. So I think there's a lot of research to be done there. Jeremy asked a question about why not use political settlements literature. I think there's a lot of great political settlements work and I think it's got a lot better recently. I think Hazel Gray's recent summary for the Oxford uh, Encyclopedia of African Politics has really clarified and strengthened the framework. Myself, I've never been particularly convinced that it provides a parsimonious explanation for the kind of things we're talking about that a straightforward historical institutionalist framework, for example, does not. So to me, it seems to add more complexity rather than to add parsimony and explanatory power. So I don't tend to use political settlements myself, but I can, I can see why others would. Very quickly on the reason why these countries were selected. I mean, essentially today, I just picked a regional definition. Uh, it wasn't a political unit that I was looking at. So that's a good point. I deliberately left out a number of smaller countries because I didn't want the graphs to become too complicated. And I deliberately picked countries that I've researched recently to give me a bit more ability to speak from personal experience. Um, so that's basically the explanation of why I looked at those countries. Absolutely, in a full study of Southern Africa, we should include East Swatini, Lesotho, um, and all those other countries that were mentioned, of course. Nick, thank you so much, Nick. Um, do you want to add? Just what, can I just add one sentence uh, about these about the uh, these democracy indices? If you know they're highly correlated, the three polity VDEM and and Freedom House. But what's interesting and, and goes very much to, to Nick's point is is that the further back in time you go, the more highly correlated they are. And so when VDEM, you know, VDEM is the last one to to come into existence in the last ten years, but it goes all the way back to 1900, right? Well. When you go to say the 70s, for Africa at least, um, apparently uh, Leo Ariola was telling me this, 
that the uh, VDEM correlates much, much more closely with Freedom House, with both suggests something about retrospective, uh, uh, you know, uh, coding, but also that the average expert, when asked, you know, how democratic uh, was, was Guinea-Bissau in 1970, they, the first thing they tend to do is go to Freedom House to see how, what Freedom House said, right? And, and that's, again, when I was talking about the herd effect, that's very much what I have in mind. Thank you. Um, let's get a final set of questions. So, uh, uh, Robert, uh, uh, I can see your hand is up. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Shatira. Uh, good to see that you're keeping well, Maeda. Nice to see you. And hopefully things in Ronda Bosch are, are doing okay, you know. Uh, Nick, uh, thanks from the outset for mentioning UCT and for, you know, uh, getting people just, again, aware of what they can do to, to help UCT. So thanks very much for that. Uh, I just had two kind of questions. One is that kind of thinking to Bob and Michael Bratton's work, you know, that uh, people in Africa have different definitions of democracy, right? So I was wondering over the past few decades, uh, have they become more economic in orientation? Have they become more political in orientation? Does that maybe affect how people uh, kind of see or their democratic disappointment in some context? And then just a second um, question is that, you know, the other side of this point is the rejection of, of authoritarian alternatives. And do you have a sense of, you know, if we are, we've got the strong demand for democracy, but democratic dissatisfaction, have we seen any movement in support for authoritarian alternatives in, in the region? So thanks very much for the presentation. Um, before you take the, any other questions, uh, if any of you have a question, please shoot. Marianne has a question in the comments, which is about presidential leadership and should we be less excited about new political leadership moments when the fundals, fundamentals remain pretty much the same? So we could perhaps have a reflect on that question about leadership. Um, Robert um, asked a great question. Of course, Nick, has, Nick knows this literature cool. and the data as well. From my perspective, you know, so the Afrobarometer has two different ways you can look at democracy. You know, one is basically, is democracy preferable to any other system? And the other is the rejection of, I think, one party rule, military rule, one man dictatorship, et cetera. And what the Afrobarometer shows us is that very high numbers of people support democracy if you ask the question, is democracy preferable? But it's a much lower percentage of people who say yes and then reject all the other auto authoritarian alternatives. I think it's down to about 46% from 75%, something like that, between just supporting democracy. And so Mike Braddon and others have pointed out, as I think Nick did, that there's a high level of support democracy, but perhaps it's relatively thin. I think it's also true though, that when you actually ask people in very pointed questions, would you support one party state? Would you support one leader, uh, one man rule? You get very high percentages of people that say no. And we've run those questions in our own surveys with, with longer kind of versions. So I think it's true that you don't find necessarily that many people who reject every authoritarian alternative, but I think you see fairly high proportions of people in most African societies who reject each authoritarian alternative when asked about it explicitly. Um, you asked a question, Robert, about the economic issues. Mike Braddon has a lovely working paper on this that you can go and see. Sashua and I are actually writing about democracy for a keywords piece for African Studies Review. And so we looked at this data relatively recently. Um, yes, I mean, one of the things that the Afrobarometer found early on was that actually, you know, the majority of people defined democracy in terms of the kind of classic procedural definition, that it was to do with elections, it was to do with rule of the people, that it involved certain political rights and civil liberties. Economic aspects were tied to that. Some people thought that to be a full quality democracy, you had to have economic goods being provided to citizens. And there were certain countries, particularly if I remember rightly, countries in Southern Africa and in particular South Africa, where people understood democracy in more economic terms. So one of the things that's interesting is to see whether or not, as you say, that variation in the understanding of democracy, perhaps with it being more closely tied to economic transformation in certain countries and others, means that economic factors have been more impactful on evaluations of democracy than others. 
from what I've seen, there hasn't been a significant shift over the last few years in terms of how people under, understand democracy, and partly part because initially there was a majority of people in Africa who understood democracy in those procedural terms. One of the things I think we have seen, though, is a slight shift in Southern Africa away from that more economic understanding. Um, interestingly, as I was showing you in the survey data, South Africa is one of the countries that we've seen the most disappointing pointing shift in popular opinion recently though. We see people being more cynical about elections and we see people being more cynical about democracy. And we see people in South Africa more willing to trade democracy off for other kinds of goods than in most other countries on the continent. Despite the fact that of course, in some ways it's delivered better than other countries on the continent. So I think that's a really interesting conundrum for us moving forwards. In terms of Marianne's question, I think yes, I think we should be very suspicious when a new leader comes to power, tells us they're going to reform and do lots of fantastic things, but they're embedded in a problematic context. Yes. In Chad? Yes. In Tanzania? Yes. Because even if that leader is well-intentioned, they have two things to cope with. One, an institutional context that shapes the ability to move political change. And two, usually vested powers within the ruling party that know that it's in their interest to veto significant political change. And so even well-meaning leaders can struggle to ensure uh, that that change is pushed through. So both with President Sami or President Hassan, depending on how you want to say it in Tanzania, but also if we were to see political change in other parts of the region, I think it's important not to simply rush to the assumption that a new leader means new democratic opportunities. And I'll give Nick the final word. Nick, uh, uh, under two minutes, uh, uh, would you also touch on the question raised earlier by Amara on why you know, VDEM, VDEM data suggested democratic stability in some African countries while publications from scholars within uh, those countries told a different story, as you, as you wrap it up. Well, I mean, you know, um, Freedom House consults quite broadly um, for its codings and, and talks to a number of scholars in country. I mean, um, when you look at the roster of people who they they credit with, um, you know, with advice um, in the codings, it, it includes a lot of in-country um, people. Now, at the same time, you know, you have a military coup in, in a country or a failed military coup. How do you assess it? Well, honest people will disagree whether it, it's causing lasting damage to the system or not, you know. Um, and I mean, uh, these, these, these uh, indices are moved by individual events. And the, the, the endless debate is whether or not um, the coders are weighing those events too, too much or not, you know? So, I, I mean, as a general rule, I, I don't think it's fair to say that they're not consulting local expertise, but people disagree on, on, on this. I mean, and that's why I think VDEM has the intellectual honesty to 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 give a, a a metric on how confident they are about their um, their assessment, and you find actually that there there's sometimes quite a wide um, you know uh, band of uncertainty around the the codings that they produce. Now, once they produce it, people tend to ignore the level of confidence that they've expressed. You know. I mean, I, um, but I, but I, I mean, one would have to be, one would have to talk about individual cases. If you look at, if you compare the indices, you see that they typically disagree about a, a very small number of countries, you know, uh, and uh, and so we can argue about, you know, why VDEM classifies. I, I, I don't, I can't think of an example off, off the top of my head, but you know, why they're much more sanguine about country X than than Freedom House is. And, and maybe it has to do with, uh, with who they consulted locally. We, we didn't talk about the Ibrahim index, which is another index also highly correlated, but with also slightly different uh, approaches and which has really pushed itself as the African index, right? They, they, don't, they only look at Africa and, and, and they're, they rely, they say they rely more on, on uh, expertise within the continent. Thank you.
Nick and Nick, thank you so much for, for having you and for excellent insights on, on our, our first webinar. We are delighted that you agreed to join us, but we are more are grateful to all of you who joined us for this conversation. Um, at the end of it all, it looks like reports of the demise of democracy in Africa were grossly exaggerated. Um, uh, there are concern, areas of concern, uh, but we must also not lose sight of the progress we are making. Uh, I like the, the point that we should no longer talk about democratic consolidation, but, uh, uh, but progress at this stage. Um, uh, we are at the Institute for uh, Democracy, uh, Citizenship and Public Policy in Africa, uh, um, hoping that you join us in subsequent discussions. These are monthly uh, seminars and look out for our next uh, exciting topic uh, uh, next month on our Twitter page, uh, IDCPPA, and uh, also on our uh, mailing list. Um, so at this stage, I, I just want to thank the speakers once again. Uh, for agreeing to, uh, to talk to us and, and for the excellent insight they've shared with us uh, and everyone else who attended. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you.